All right, so welcome, guys. Uh, it's good to have you here on a Saturday morning, especially. So that's uh, thanks for coming here. Uh, hopefully, we'll make the most of this session, and then hopefully, we all will learn something today. So, uh, so that's good. Uh, so, just brief uh, get to know each other type of stuff. So, how many of you? Uh, so let, let's start with me, right? So, uh, so I'm Chinmay Naik. I have been working with Equal Experts for around three years now. And uh, worked with uh, mostly enterprise projects. Uh, recently, working on some products that we are working with. And uh, in terms of technology, I don't really. Uh, I mean, I don't want to start there because it's just as we said, as Mayank said, right? We we work on variety of technology. So, uh, so my my aim or the thing that I want to accomplish is getting simple and clear solutions to the client. So, whichever technology we use, it doesn't matter, right? As long as we use the right tool for the right job, so that's that's uh, that's probably me. Uh, what about you guys? Like, how many of you uh, are are working or have worked with JavaScript, for example? Let's because so yeah, almost all of you, I guess. So that's that's good. And uh, a, any anyone who's worked with Node.js, oh, okay, couple of you guys. So that's nice. Uh, so what what we did, right? We uh, Few months back, we had this project in our in our company internal project, which we which we uh, implemented using Node.js, and then we wanted to write automated tests for that, so uh, so that we don't have to test it manually. So, so do you know? Do you guys know what what is automated testing and automated 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 end to end testing for applications? So, so what is that? Can you give me an example of and why that matters or something? You know, why why do we care? About that, anyway. So we would like this to be interactive session, right? So it's not that I talk and then you guys just listen and do the workshop. It's it's all interactive. You want to learn, even I want to learn from you guys. Your work experience, your your past, right? So what what do you think are uh, like? Why should we write automated tests? If I change anything, any functionality, so it should not break the existing functionality, so that you know automatically before I manually go ahead and test it. So that if the build gets failed, so that I I will come to know. Cool. So it's early feedback, right? Yes. I get very early, very fast feedback. So that's that's one. Uh, what else can you think of? Is there anything else that you can think of? And uh, you can do early builds to the clients also. So in this way. Yeah, so you have confidence, right? Again, he's touching the same point. So it's very good. So we have confidence on in our product. Whatever we do, I am sure, I'm damn sure that this works. At least it doesn't break in these main areas, main workflows that I have, right? So that's that's good. So so quickly, uh, so these are the things that I felt uh, are the real value for uh, for using automated testing. One is the confidence I get. Uh, I can change anything in my application, and then. Just make sure that the tests. I mean, if I have enough coverage and enough tests, uh, I I make any change in the existing code. Also, uh, I am confident that if my tests pass, everything works nicely and clearly. So that's that's a confidence that I get, and I try to. I can ship early. I can ship often. I can refactor fearlessly because of because of uh, the confidence that I have in the test. Right? Uh, there is a lot of business value in acceptance tests. So it, it, it so I'm specifically talking about acceptance tests now, and not the unit or the small level tests that we use for technical benefit and everyday work. Right? Those are essential too. Those are very vital, and we use that every day. Uh, the real value for the customers, however, is comes from acceptance tests. Like if if I if if you had a product right and you have thousand unit tests which cover all the product, but uh, if you look at it right, if all of your units work, is that does that give you confidence? You can I can always there's always a workflow that you can do and uh, it it kind of breaks the application, but the units still pass because they are what they are just thinking about the isolate isolating the parts. So units are uh, really okay. Everything else is constant. I'm working on this this small module. Does that work? Given all the external state is same, or given I don't care about external state, is my module or is my small unit that I'm testing works? And that's a very vital test to have. It's not there's no there's no negative thing about that. It's just a it's just very technology focused, or it's just very implementation, or uh, it, it helps us, not the business really. If you if you look at it right, whereas the acceptance test or the end to end test, they help business and they. They they have this business value that if these workflow work, which are like 80% of my workflows for my application, then I can say sh for sure that this application will will work end to end, and there won't be any surprises there, right? So that's that's the value for business. 
and uh, the best part i think i like about acceptance test uh, uh, like hardly or not many of us right get to work on or get to create software from from scratch so that's and we have to live with the existing code existing applications and you have to just add few functionalities just tweak here and there and then add some stuff here and there right so we we i think we spend almost 80% of time reading the code than writing the code i uh, generally you know even in, even in your own code right even if it's a from scratch project you would still if you wanted to add some functionality to something you would have to read through uh, where to go about which class to change what method to add or something like that right so it's all about uh, making it better making it more readable uh, in the end for for us so that works for legit legacy apps also like acceptance test you can write it uh, you can write for legacy apps also so that's that's probably the best part uh, which i feel uh, is for the acceptance test that most of the applications if they are already running and we have had bugs there or we have had surprises in the production and we which which, which we wanted to eliminate uh, the you could you could start with acceptance test you could also start with unit test but probably uh, in unit test you you i don't know if you have if you guys have had to write very small unit level tests for for a already existing application how easy or how difficult or what was your experience like uh, but for me i think my experience was uh, it mostly it's difficult to write a very nice and clean clear unit test that really adds value to uh, to the to the code uh, i mean you can always write a unit test and get it passing but if that doesn't really give you confidence if it doesn't really uh, assert something that's that's really uh, the business it's it's a bit difficult to and it's it's a bit flaky also it's just no point in writing that uh, so whereas acceptance test here shine really and then because you don't worry about the application uh, how it's implemented right it's just like a back, black box to you so you worry about how do i interact what if i am a user how would i click this button and then what would i do what would i get back on the screen or so that's that's the end to end thing you you ignore the small bits as to this class sets the variable over there and then is that variable set properly and all that stuff right you you don't worry about these small small things you worry about uh, the application in general so that's that's uh, a good thing for for the legacy app uh, uh, so uh, so what we'll be, we'll be covering today is uh, casper js uh, it's a framework for writing acceptance test uh, in javascript so uh, so brief about node because it's uh, i think it deserves a mention here so uh, what do you think i mean what uh, for the for the guys who have used node uh, did they really find an advantage or what kind of applications did you use node for big data processes big data processes okay uh so what question be a part of the Problems. Yes. Okay. Mostly when you everything is event driven from end to end. Right. So event driven. Okay. Cool. So cool. So what uh, what is really Node? Uh, we we it's it's a JavaScript on the server. So if you know JavaScript, you kind of already know what Node is in a sense. Uh, you have a basic idea of the syntax. There is nothing no no new major syntax to learn really. It's it's JavaScript. Uh, so the main the main uh, feature or the main uh, driving thing in the node is is really it's event driven and non blocking io right so what, what do we mean by event driven and non blocking io uh, in 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 typical right in 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 java or any of the language any of the uh, c sharp java or probably uh, some of the other over languages right you we we program like this we say okay var uh, we could say okay we want to get data from database i want to fetch customers and then once i fetch the customers i want to uh, find out the orders that they have placed right so i say customers uh, i have a sql query which goes to database gets the customers and from there i get all the orders for each of the customers let's say so so if if you look at one one request from application from from a user so browser uh, if i click show my orders on my on my application what that fires that fires a web request and the web server possibly creates a thread for that or uses a thread from the thread pool and it then assigns that uh, request and response to that thread that's how typical uh, you know web stuff works right so what you do there is you have a uh, uh, 
I mean, you you your, the thread has to go and fetch the data, fetch the values from the database. Now, while I mean, we all know I/O is very slow, right? I/O is the bottleneck in in computing, not the CPU processes, right? I/O is the bottleneck, so it goes and fetches the data. But while the I/O and the disk are working, the thread can't do anything. It's just sitting there and waiting for the data to come back. It, it is kind of blocked or it's sleeping or waiting for the I/O to complete, right? So. And once the I/O is complete, so we are losing CPU cycles. We are losing the thread. We could have used that same thread for something else, for some CPU processes or something, which we can't do now because it's blocked for that I/O. And then once that I/O gets completed, when, once you have the data, you come back, that thread resumes, and then it it does the next operation. Again, if that's a blocking operation, you again block. So you kind of, if you have a if you have a very uh, networked application, or if you are talking to many services or many databases, or if you are getting or fetching data from multiple services uh, via network, probably you would you would you would have a lot of uh, blocking I/O. So uh, non-blocking I/O or event-driven is is exact is what what how does it solve that problem? What it does is there is in Node especially there is an event loop. So you have something like a, a a thread, a single thread, that's running in the background. So it's like UI thread. Right? Any of us have, if you have interacted with any of the UI or GUI applications in our desktops, let's say, you 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 know, right? Even click on some button, while the action is performed, you can still move your mouse and click another button and see what's going on here and there. So how they handle that? So they they have this something called as event loop, which which runs a, as a single thread in the backend. Which just what it does, it just dispatches the event. So all it does is, okay, I've got an event for getting the data from database. Fine. Uh, it it spawns a new or it 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 asks the I/O to do that, and then it comes back again. It and says, okay, I'll, I'll execute the next operation in line. And then if that's again a blocking operation, I instruct or I uh, use I/O or let I/O handle that, and then I come back and do the next operation. And any time the I/O is complete. There is a callback that I get, or there is a uh, so the way we can so we'll figure out how the syntax is and how it is done in real life. Uh, so it's a it's a single thread event loop, and uh, the real biggest difference in Node and simple JavaScript is really you don't have a DOM. In, in JavaScript, you pretty much always are on a browser and you always have a DOM, right? You you interact with DOM elements. You say, okay, I want this selector. You use multiple selectors to. Use jQuery or any other libraries, and then you work with that, right? So, Node, since it runs on the server and not on the browser, you don't have a DOM. That's that's one of the changes. So, uh, what we will be covering today is mainly uh, Casper JS. So, what what is that? So, that's a uh, scripting and navigation uh, testing utility for uh, for Phantom and Slimmer. So, if you if you go if you went to uh, Casper JS website or if you um, so in in automated testing, there are multiple uh, ways, right? You can have um you can have full browser tests like i can create in selenium or a web driver if you've used or if you use an automated test using that you would actually spawn up a new firefox or a whatever chrome instance and then you would actually see the application see that the button is getting clicked see there's something added in the text box and then the form is submitted and things like that right you can actually so it's not headless uh so the the Casper JS and the Phantom especially Phantom and Slimmer JS. Slimmer is is not totally headless, but Phantom JS is is for WebKit. So uh, WebKit and Gecko are these browser engines, right? These that power the browsers. The browsers, your Chrome, your Firefox, your uh, Safari, they use a browser engine to to actually understand and render the contents on 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 the on the browser window, right? So Phantom is a headless headless WebKit. So you can uh, you can have a headless test. So what is a headless test? You you run a test and that doesn't spawn a browser, but actually it it kind of has a non GUI browser in in internally. So that's that's where we call it headless. There's no head, uh, and therefore you will see that these names have are all have to do with with a ghost ghost or something like that. So Casper is a ghost, Phantom and and there is a lot of uh, related tools and utilities. They all have the same theme of uh, being headless.
so uh, so that's that so there's nothing much there in the slides let's let's just quickly dive in and see see what we have to do and see what we we can do today uh, so any any feedback any questions you have uh, just shout and stop me and we, we can just discuss quickly yeah so when we say the uh, SQJ is uh, non blocking IO, is there a single thread creating the subthreads or something like that? Okay, so I might have confused you a bit here. So Casper.js is is a utility that we'll be studying here. Uh, that kind of has really nothing to do with Node in a sense. But why I wanted to mention Node is uh, since we are anyways talking about JavaScript and we are writing it on server side, so uh, or as a separate kind of a command line utility, I thought I would talk about Node as well. So it's a Node feature. Uh, so. Yes, so event loop and everything, that's that's a node stuff, node related stuff. Uh, Casper.js has kind of really nothing to do with uh, to with what node is or how node works. Uh, yeah, so so let's quickly see. Uh, so uh, actually I, uh, we, as my said, right, we were not pl really planning for a proper workshop, but let's say we have, we're at 10.50 now and we probably have, uh, I'm planning to limit this to 12 12 30 maximum is that fine or right so so what we can I'm, I'm thinking we can actually do a workshop and you guys can actually uh, code along with me so uh, do you do you guys if you're interested obviously if if it's fine you just want to look at it then it's fine as well so uh, you can side by side you can set up uh, Casper JS it's just uh, if you have npm and node uh, it's very easy to have uh, to, to get Casper.js, uh, use the npm minus g install Casper.js, and you would get it. Uh, and what we can do now is let's let's try to uh, let's try to write a proper end-to-end -end tests application test for for a for a simple app. So uh, so let's say let's start that. Uh, So what I have is I will be working on uh, this to-do application. Uh, we were initially thinking of using a proper uh, big application, but probably because of the time domain, uh, time diff, uh, time uh, uh, constraint. Switch on the lights. Yes, please do. Um, so you can also uh, go and have a look at this app. Uh, it's. I'll probably not use mic now. If it's fine, I'll I'll try to be loud here, and uh, because it's just very difficult for me to type and use mic. Yeah. So all you need. Can people see that you are to do MVC. So all you have to do is uh, Google for to do MVC Angular, and you would get it. Actually, you could use any app, uh, but I I started with Angular, so probably. Uh, so we can use that. It doesn't really matter which which app. So let's let's just find out. So it's to do MVC. Uh, okay. Uh, one quick thing: if if people are uh, interested in accessing the internet, right? Um, the Wi-Fi password and username are here. Yeah. Can all of you see that? The Wi-Fi. Yeah. So you can just search for to do MVC and go to AngularJS, and this is what you get. Um, so what I have done here is, uh, so what we want to do, let's say, let's understand the app first before we can start writing the tests, right? And we don't know anything about Casper, let's say. We, we're just starting. So we'll, we'll learn as and f by finding, by figuring out stuff, right? But we know the aim that we want to do. We, we want to write tests for this. So what is this application? What does this application do? It's a simple to-do list, right? So what you can do is you can add to-dos. Let's say uh, I can add a to-do. To -do. And uh, it could be uh, uh, something like this, and then I can say, okay, uh, that's done, and this is remaining. Let's say so I can, and then probably I can say, okay, this all can be done. Or uh, this is a very simple to-do list, right? All of us are probably familiar with that. Uh, and then you could you could remove item from a to-do list. And once you are done with all the items, let's say I'm done with Phantom also, so I say, okay, I want to remove this. So clear all the computer items. So that's then I'm back to normal. So very simple, simple domain. There is nothing, nothing big or new to learn here, as far as the domain is concerned. So uh, let's start by. So what, what do you think, right? What do you think we can test here? What is the application behavior? 
and what all what all features does this application have let's let's just quickly discuss about that so that we know what we can try to write or what what is the test that you can write automated test for this application what can you test for this app right so i you should basically be able to add to do items and and see that the to do's are added right that's one so that's a very simple one the small one so that's that's good so let's say I, I i'm able to add something like this uh and that gets added that's that's the behavior what else could be what else could be could be the behavior right so again i, I can mark the to do is completed i can also remove to do if i wanted to so these are the small 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 bits and uh, that we have right in the application so this is a very very minimalistic and very simple and dumb example that we are taking but again that's that's for a purpose because we don't want to complicate the domain and then uh, it just becomes difficult to to write tests and this is kind of a legacy app for us we haven't written this code i mean it's some guy who is who is there's open source repository and those guys have written this code and they they have the app live and what we want to do is we want to make sure that this works right that's that's our goal let's say so how how do we start so let's say uh, let me just go and show you what what casper is and how so if you if you go to casper's home page you would see that it's a navigation scripting and testing utility for phantom and slimmer um, so what all it can provide it provides features like uh, maybe can you guys see that uh, you can uh, do all sort of uh, navigation stuff you can click buttons links you can fill up text boxes you can select radio buttons you can fill up forms and submit forms you can upload files you can take screenshot of uh, of a particular page if you wanted to those are all the, small, all the capabilities that are provided uh, thanks to phantom uh, so and then if you look at it right uh, you can uh, download resources and this is for writing functional test suits and web scrapping really if you wanted to scrap a few web pages and find out the common element or whatever if you wanted to do that probably this you could use some some something like this okay so let's start uh, with with a very uh, let's let's start right we want to know we we know what we want to test uh, where is that so this is the application right so we know what we want to test so we want to let's say test first that uh, so this is where i am going to be coding uh, can you guys see this is that visible back there okay cool uh, so that font is good so what i have is a simple uh, so i have installed casper js let me show you that uh, so i have is that is that visible here so what i have casper js installed and if i say help it gives me uh, the options and what it is and uh, the docs and all that it's a basic command line utility that that you you can start with and uh okay so so let's say first for very starters right we let's let's have to start with what we want to test is uh this uh this to do app that we have there is a heading called to dos so i want to check that there is a heading for to dos there should be a heading called to dos in in there when i when i this is like a application logo or uh, or the main main uh, thing for me for the application to 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 find out what this application is so let's say i want to test this, this is there indeed right so uh, so how do i do that so so the way is you It, it, for writing tests any test you say okay casper so there is a casper instance available here in the in the script uh it could be just any script so i what i have created is just a so let's say let's say create a spec file right so i can delete this file so i have created a brand new spec.js file uh and i start writing so so let's just figure out okay so there is a casper instance uh that that's there and i can say i want to start a test so let's say i start okay casper dot test dot begin i start a test and i want to i want to give a name to the test what this test is so let's say uh, i say i'm testing the to do's functionality so i want to make sure that the header is there so i say okay uh, the to do header is found something like that right and then what i do is function uh and then i start the test so yeah, 
Okay, it's very difficult for me to speak. Okay, so let me do it this way. So function, right? Uh, and I all I do is let's say. Uh, so we want to. So what we know, we know, right? We we want to go to this application URL. We want to open this URL. And once that URL is open, we want to make sure that there is a title, there is a to do's header here, something like that. So that's what we want to do. So since since we don't know anything about this application, we'll have to figure out how, first of all, how to open this URL using Casper. Right? That's that's the first thing probably. How do I open a particular URL using Casper JS in, in Casper JS before I can uh, assert some things, right? So um, so what you can do, you can you can say Casper dot start. And this is all. There is a doc, there is a doc, good and a nice documentation for uh, for that. And that's one of the reasons actually we chose Casper JS uh, way back. Uh, at that time, we wanted to write something. The acceptance is in JavaScript. And the other libraries they were all very low level, either low level uh, or they had very. Uh, it, it was just very hard to figure out how to get along and what to do and what not to do. Uh, so, so Casper has very nice documentation and it's. The even user community is, is nice. You have you get a lot of uh, answers on Stack Overflow, Google if you search for. So it's a fairly nice library, I would say. So so let's start, right? So we wanted to open this URL. So I can give this URL complete URL. I'd say uh, I want to let me so do that. Yeah. That's better. So I have this URL. Uh, maybe I can take this URL into a app URL. Separate app URL. So let's say I say var app URL equal to that, and I and I just pass it over here app URL. And then once that URL is open, I can say I want to say function uh, So this is like a uh, if you look at it, this 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 follows the same syntax. A, in JavaScript, you have you you fire AJAX request, right? You typically have a okay dollar dot whatever AJAX jQuery AJAX, and then you have these callbacks, success and error callbacks. So that's very similar here. Uh, you have you are opening a URL, and once that URL is open, you can say call this function for me. That's what you're saying over here. Once that URL is done, you call this function for me. So so in in a way, that's that's where I was talking about non-blocking. If if I were to have function, if I were to print something here. That would be printed before that URL, before that function gets executed. Typically, uh, because it's over a network call and that usually takes time, right? Uh, so far with me, you guys, or should I? Is that fine? Is this space fine, right? So, so the aim is to uh, to f to check the to do's header is found in in a particular. So that's that's the goal that we have, right? Let's not for uh, digress on the goal. So we are opening this URL, and once that URL is open, I want to now somehow be able to assert that the title is there. So I want to now actually find out in the DOM that the to dos there is somewhere to dos is written somewhere. So we need to find out where that is. So let's go to HTML and let's find out where is this in the DOM. So if you inspect this element, you would find that it's in the heading, uh, rightly so. So you would say, okay, there is a heading H1 called to dos. So I want to make sure that it is to do that is written over here. Nothing, nothing. Uh, if I change it to sample, this will become sample. But that my assertion should be it should be to do, right? I want it to be a to do because this is a to do application. So, uh, so what I would do, I want to find out. Uh, let's say using XPath. Have you heard about XPath? Uh, do you know what that is? Uh, so very basically, I mean, it's a, in a very simple terms, XPath is is a locator that you can use. To find elements in XML tree, so X is for XML, path is for finding things in the XML. You, you traverse a path to reach somewhere, right? That's that's a very uh, basic one one minute introduction on XPath, I think. So the way uh, you would write XPath is, let's say we want to find out an element using XPath. So let's say we we uh, what I want to do in, in Chrome, you can actually uh, search for XPath. So let me. Let me mention that. Is that visible? Or right. So, so there is a variable called dollar x uh, in Chrome console. You can write an XPath there, and 
if it's found the element will be highlighted so this we know is a heading right h1 which contains the text called to do's so let's say we we find it that way so the way syntax for writing xpath is is really this uh, you say So these are we are searching in the root of the document from the root of the document, um, and what we want to find is h1, h1 that has text. The text in the h1 should be equal to uh, to do's, right? Uh, oh yeah, of course. So if you look at this H1, it found this H1, and right? if I go hover over here, it highlights this H1 for me. So I know that this H1, so that's correct X path and valid X path. Uh, so yes, so then I can copy this X path. So this is how I would have, I would test whether the X path that I'm checking works fine on Chrome or any, even in Firefox, there is a Firebug. If you're using Firebug, there is a Firepath tool that you can use and uh, and find out the X path. So so got the X path, and now I say. Uh, let's say so I I somehow want to know how in Casper I can find out a particular element and assert that the element text is something like that right that I want I want that capability and uh, this is visible in the UI the element is visible in the UI right so I want that so let's say I say where x path or header x path header x path is equal to that. And uh, so the way you would do that, uh, so Casper has the mechanism. So let's find out. Maybe in the documentation, let's find out. So I have here opened the Casper documentation, the Casper module. Uh, so there are multiple modules here. You have a Casper module, you have utils module, you have mouse module. Because uh, in a web page, you 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 can. So most of the functions are typically available in the Casper module, and some of the utility functions are there in the util module. We can we can see what functions are there, and uh, if you wanted to click on let's say some pixel uh, pixel 435 by 220 with the mouse, you could do that using mouse functionality. There is a mouse module. So uh, if you were to click, if you wanted to click on some particular element, uh, there is a you can if you can locate that element by XPath, you can click using XPath or if you wanted extra mouse functionality, drag and drop, and some things like that, you would have to go to mod mouse module, which probably we won't be able to cover today. But uh, let's find out if, how do I? Uh, is there a way to to make sure that the element is seen on the web page? Is there something called as visible? So let's say okay, then visible true. Uh, yes. So this probably is something uh, that we can look for. Uh, that's too bad. Okay. Uh, visible. So there is a visible. Uh, I can say even is there a way to assert that something is visible? Let's find that out. Uh, assert maybe visible. Uh, okay. So uh, in the documentation, let me check. So so all the assertions related things are in the test module so if, if i were to go in the test module there is a uh, there is a assert that some element is visible or some element has some text or some element has is there there are various conditions you can assert on so for starters let's just uh, so there is casper dot uh, test again that's one module that you are trying to use over here and then you can say assert uh, visible uh, and then I am saying I want to make sure that the uh, this whatever I have xpath right this xpath is the element with that xpath is visible in in the DOM. So the the syntax again is uh, you can you can say I have type of uh, xpath path and uh, the the path actual path. So I say path is equal to uh, header xpath and then if that element is visible I I, I, I can give a nice text that the to do's uh, header is visible so I have this just uh, is the font a bit so 
so this is what I have in the test and I think that's there is an assertion and we are going to a URL and then checking that something is available so that's that's probably a complete test although it's a very simple and very basic test but it, it's still complete so uh, again there is some some so one thing that we learned while we were using Casper and we had to figure out the syntax and uh, that that was a that was a challenge for I think a week or two but then after that after two weeks we we got used to it and then we we just we just got the knack of figuring out the APIs so we just said probably there is an API and then we just wrote okay assert something and actually check there was an API for that so it's very intuitive once you get the hang of it and once you know how how the modules and how the API has been structured right so uh, so let's say let's run this so the again the syntax to run is there is you can say casper dot uh, run and um, once once that's that's done you could once that's done you could say uh, my tests are done so I say casper dot uh, test dot done so again bear with me for the syntax thing here we, we can cover this later uh, so that's that's my test case that's my complete test case I think and uh, let's just try running this and see if this really works or makes sense right? so let's say the way to learn the way to uh, run this test you say casper.js I have installed casper.js uh, and then the test I want to test uh, the file name so I say spec.js so it's running this test called to do header is found and then to do header is visible it says okay that's correct that's that's done so the awesome but then I mean every time a test pass first time I, I get a very I get a strange feeling probably is that is that really done is that something that's really running and because you can't see it right it's headless so you, I, I want a nice feedback I want something feedback to see whether it's actually it's actually there right so so let's say uh, what we can do we can uh, first of all let's make it fail let's just change this to do's to uh, to XYZ something that we definitely know doesn't exist on that web page and let's just see it running and see if it fails it should fail right it should definitely fail now if if everything is working fine so let's see um, somehow this is true <coughs> am I connected to internet yes so it should work it's again fetching the data from the internet problem that's taking so much time uh, um, so that's that and then so let it run let it figure that out uh, maybe it's the internet uh, that's very slow so uh, while while that we, we talked about feedback right we, I want to see whether that web page is actually loaded uh, although we are in headless mode is there a way to really see see that page so yes there is you can you can actually capture the screenshot of a page even you are in headless mode so you don't have a DOM or you don't have a page but you would still like to see a feedback get a feedback right so you can capture oh yeah so this failed right it failed for uh, for that that xpath was incorrect so there was no no header to do header is visible is failed that's the assertion that is failed right are you guys with me are you guys still following along uh, cool so let's change that to to do's and we know it's passes but what I want is I want a feedback I want I want to see that that page in some way it just doesn't give me confidence right uh, to if you're if you have never worked with headless uh, browser before or headless uh, mode before this is something that we felt okay I want to see something is there a way to see uh, see the action see the action there so uh, so there is a utility <coughs> you can you can capture screenshot using Casper so uh, what you can do is you can say uh, casper dot then again I'll, I'll explain the API quickly uh, so once so what I'm saying is once the start is done then once this complete uh, so this is maybe so let's just write it down and then I'll explain what uh, what's strange about the API and why that API right uh, so so there is a you can do you can do function and I can say Casper uh, <coughs> dot <coughs> capture. 
and I say okay image dot png. So I want to capture the screenshot in an image dot png of that web page. Once that web page is loaded, I want to see that the page is actually indeed loaded, right? That's what I want to see. So uh, that's the way you would do. And let's just see if it works again. Uh, so let's see. This should pass because I've changed the to-dos to uh, proper to-dos, and this passes. And uh, we said, okay, image dot png. We wanted some image to be. We were expecting image. So let's see if there is an image. Uh, so yes, there is. So let's say open this image. <coughs> so if you look at it, there is an image. So this is the web page. It, it was able to get that web page and find that to do here so it is actually indeed loading the loading the web page and here is here is what you can see right is the so it, are you guys with me but if you look at the web page right if i have a look at the web page what does it look like uh, the one that you are testing so if i try to do that uh, if i were to go in a normal uh, so if I were to zoom, uh, this is how it would look like. But if I were to if I were to have have it on uh, default zoom, this is what it looks like, right? <laughs> so again, uh, so again, this prop this page is probably responsive in the sense that if I am uh, if I zoom it enough, so it probably understands that probably the user is viewing it in a mobile browser or a tablet or something. It's responsive. It tries to detect the screen viewport. And then based on that, it, it adjusts itself. It hides the unnecessary elements so that you can just focus on the important content here. So that's what this is doing. So, uh, but if I wanted to have it on, uh, if I wanted to have a desktop viewport, in a sense, I wanted to know uh, Casper should run using a particular viewport, as if I'm running it in my Chrome or Firefox or Safari, right? I wanted to do that. So there is a way. Again, you can set the viewport in Casper. So uh, let's go back to the script again. And these are the config options that that Casper has. Uh, we'll, we have to quickly talk about what the then functionality and then then feature. But let me just cover this first. So you can do Casper dot options dot uh, view view viewport size. <coughs> uh, so you can say okay, what's the width? Width is I want one zero two four. Let's say and. Uh, Height I want let's uh, say 760. Small. So I'm just setting the viewport globally so that it affects all the tests or all the things in the script. It's just set on the Casper global object, right? So now if I were to run this, uh, this should work and this should find, tell me. Um, so if I'm running the, yeah, I'm running the test again. So it should find out. Uh, Okay, that, let's open the image and see for ourselves. So if you look at it now, the web page is due to the viewport, it understood that this is the viewport. So it kind of instructed the headless mode to have to set that user agent or set that viewport size so that the the JS on the page uh, doesn't hide the elements. Right? So you can see this is complete web page that you can see as is. So it's a screenshot, right? So. So this is kind of gives me a feedback as to this is indeed loading in the browser and this is working fine. Um, right. So we want to now talk about what is that then. So do you, so let's quickly talk about what this syntax and the syntax stuff. So uh, so in Node, right? I mentioned some time back uh, the JavaScript, the Node language in a sense, the Node platform is event driven. So anytime you write some 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 line of code, if that uh, if that is a sync call or if that has to wait for block, it has to wait for I/O or some other thing to uh, to fulfill that call. What it does, it it just runs that separately and then proceeds with the execution. So uh, if if I were to let's say if I were to uh, ignore this then. Right. If I were to ignore this, then and if I were to capture the screenshot, for example, let's say if I were to do that, what would happen is uh, this would start and this statement would run. This is a single statement, right? And this call is a function which is a kind of a callback call. Once that function is done, you call this for me, please. That's what I'm saying. 
So this app URL is it's a HTTP call, so it's definitely going to take some time. It's going to go over network, fetch that HTTP page, and then uh, load it on the client side. So that's that's going to definitely take some time in milliseconds or microseconds, whatever that is. And but the node, what is going to do is it's or node or Casper again, uh, what or the it's again phantom JS. So what they are going to do, so it's not going to be blocked uh, by this. So this statement would continue and. Even before you have this page, you were, you are saying to cap capture a screenshot. You are asking it to capture a screenshot, but the page loading is started. It's not completed. The page I have instructed the page to load. That's going to take some time, but I'm not waiting for that page to load. I'm saying, okay, I want the screenshot. So it will take, I don't know, weird. I've never tried this. So let's try that maybe. Uh, let's see what kind of screenshot does it do we get. Yeah, we would typically get an empty or whatever blank screen, right? So let's say we open the image. Yeah, this looks like a blank screen. So that's that's the that's the most important thing one has to uh, keep in mind when writing uh, code in Node.js or on the server side. That every every statement that that you can write, if it's async or if it's going to take time, you have to write callback or you have to write promises uh, to. To make your code nice and clean, because again, uh, if you've programmed heavily in JavaScript, you would know that callbacks can definitely go nested, and you would have a typical pyramid of callback or callback hell, as it is called. You would have those problems, right? So, if you're, in order to keep your code clean, you would need some sort of way to handle that callbacks nicely, and probably promises is is a is a nice and uh, good way to handle that. So that's what this Casper not then is really. What it is saying is so. So in this case, again here it it starts fetching the uh, HTTP page, and then immediately it calls this from this this method. But then here it here it knows okay Casper dot then. So it has to so what this then is uh, so Casper has these uh, then and uh, so you have to write kind of every function in the Casper dot then, not every but uh, you we would see an exception there later later let's say. So you are writing this uh, in a Casper dot then just. So to instruct Casper or or the underlying structure to say that once that above call is complete, then only I want to call this. So what this does is once your entire statement, in a sense, you once your callback also is complete. Once this statement or this promise is fulfilled, uh, now I'm talking about promise term. But once that is fulfilled and that's done, once it returns a value and it's complete, then only call this function. And similarly, then only run the test. And that's how you are you are kind of wrapping it inside uh, the then and the promise chain. We are creating that promise chain in a way. So far, with yeah, you? Oh, one one thing over here. If you have any doubts, please ask. Them yeah. During the we are not going to have a Q and A at the end of it. Uh, so please ask. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. Okay, so let's. Uh, one is like your Casper is uh, it's not inside the right at this point. So is that the Casper intelligence which makes it uh, run up to them? Yeah. So Casper dot. So the question is, what is Casper dot then, and how is it different from uh, Casper? No, what is Casper dot run, yeah. and how it's different from Casper dot then, in a sense? That's the question. So really, uh, Casper dot uh, run is. I haven't gone into detail and. Found out in the API how it's implemented, but what it instructs Casper is now the tests are now there is no more uh, promises and the promise chain is going to be complete. So this is where you actually start running the yes. So it's this is where once once you have Casper dot run, this is where actually it executes the test. So if you look at it right, uh, these are just so so this is where it actually starts execution, and you have to have all the then and all the promises and all the assertion and everything before that. So uh, that's what this instructs uh, Casper. So all the functional testing is going to be inside the then block. Uh, inside the then block. Inside the then block, there is there are some except uh, okay. we can we can talk about that later. Yeah, but yeah, generally uh, you would have that. Uh, if I need to, I mean, sometimes what happens is every task will come up for the compatibility issues with the browser versions and I mean sometimes. Yeah. So this, so the question is about browser compatibility and how Casper handles that. So, so how to set up the browser version for a specific unit test if at all? Sometimes it is. So uh, yes, so that's a question. So how to set a proper browser version and and how to deal browser compatible things in Casper? So the thing is, this is 
uh, not the area where Casper is intended to work with. So this is really uh, what we are saying is Casper is headless. So there is no browser in a sense. You can't have you can't really have uh, if you wanted to have browser compatible tests and you, you were to uh, write functional tests for checking browser compatib compatibility. Probably you should not use Casper. That's that's not the aim of the library. It doesn't do that. There is there is no way to set okay Firefox version is that and then run that because it runs on WebKit, which is a browser engine and uh, because Phantom uses WebKit, so. Uh, so there is no way to set browsers. It, there's there's no browsers. It just uses uh, what's provided by WebKit API internally. So for browser compatibility tests, probably Casper is not a not a solution. You you don't want to write tests using Casper right, in that case. Uh, yes. Line number nine. What are the other ways other than Xpath to get Cool, cool. So that's a question. Is there only XPath way, right? So there is no, the, there is a CSS3 selectors. You can use any CSS selectors. Uh, we can try that also. Let's try that. Should we? jQuery selectors. Uh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you can inject jQuery in uh, in Casper. So Casper, you can uh, you can say once the page is loaded, I want the jQuery to load. Uh, so there is a client scripts module in Casper with which you can load jQuery and then use jQuery as if as is you know in inbuilt in the in the Casper tests. You could do that, or if it's a simple uh, selector, for example, XPath was one way we we thought of. Uh, uh, generally, people generally XPaths are very slow and uh, slow at least at least slow in compared to ID lookups or direct CSS lookups. They're very slow, so. As far as possible, we should use CSS3 lookups or the direct hash ID lookups using jQuery or even using selectors, uh, CSS3 selectors. So we could try that. Let's let's see if there is a way to select uh, this element, this element using uh, CSS3 selector. Is there a way? So we can check that. I have a CSS uh, selector tester here. So let's see if I just okay. So there is a way. I can just select H1, uh, any H1. And from this, this one H1, I think here in this document, so we are saved. So if I just select H1 here, uh, that should that should fetch the same element, and I should be able to assert that the same thing, right? So that's possible. So you can use either CSS3 or XPath selectors. Uh, some of the functions in Casper uh, are not compatible with CSS3 XPath uh, XPath selectors. So CSS3 is generally Applicable everywhere. You always have CSS3 selectors, uh, if not XPath. There are some some functions where CS XPath selectors don't work because Phantom, which Casper uses internally, doesn't support that. So uh, you have this file upload. I think one feature that we figured out was file uploads. If I wanted to upload a file using that, and I wanted to select which where is the file upload box, and I wanted to click okay, this is where I want to go and upload this file on this button or something like that. There is no way to select that button, uh, that box using XPath selector, because Phantom internally doesn't have that capability. Right. That brings me to the question of the next question, which is uh, so basically in Casper you use it either with Phantom JS, which is WebKit, or Slimer JS, which is Gecko. Gecko, yeah. How does this uh, help me in case I want to test it with uh, IE? Is there a plugin that can uh, that I can run Casper along with? Okay, so that so about IE. <laughs> because that's everybody in the famous famous yeah question. Everybody in uh, so uh, so I mean frankly I have not used or application that we wrote tests for. Uh, we wanted headless. We really didn't didn't care about uh, how the UI looks. मतलब we were not very particular about in IE this should exactly have the same look and feel as in Firefox or same on other browsers. We were not really we did not really care about that. What we cared about was wherever it is displayed, am I able to click it and am I able to go through as a business flow? So, so you're, you're saying that the scope of your exercise testing was not yes did not include IE. Did not include IE. Uh, therefore, I'm not very I'm not I cannot really judge and tell you what is there a way to that uh, way to do that. Uh, so frankly, I don't know. I mean, in Casper, is there a way to add plugins? But I'm hoping there should be. There will be probably if it's not already there. 
similarly again uh, when i when we started looking there was very experimental support for uh, slimmer js or gecko uh, we, we when we use that now if i look at it, it there is a proper nice setup and there's things are working smoothly there so probably the next phase on their cards uh, the maintenance card probably is maybe should be ie or uh, that compatible but again if you look at it right the aim is not to really uh, have browser compatibility the aim is of this library so this is probably where i would not use casper if i were to really make sure that the website looks proper on ie and this and all of these that is not what i want to do my my aim if that's your aim uh, as as uh, so again uh, this come so we're digressing but i think it's okay uh, when when to really use this and when to not use that's that's the main question that we all face and that's a big choice that we have to make right once you make a framework choice you kind of live with it and you have to support it and you have to get along uh, with even with drawbacks so 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 for that i think uh, casper where i would use or what i have learned from and what mistakes when we you know we made while we while we were using that uh what we have learned from that mistake is i think i would use it for uh to start with small to to you know to automating end to end tests for small applications to start with and see how it fares for me uh we did it exactly for that like we had a very small application which which had a couple of functionalities some crud operations and some rep reporting and some json calls and some network services and this and that internally in the application and we wanted to test each of those components and all of that whether and uploading form you know uh, submitting forms and things like that so i would use it for uh, cases where it's uh, it's a it, it's it's where i don't really care about what browser and how it looks and and the compatibility issues that's that's probably one phase one for me that's that's one criteria major criteria because this is all headless and i don't have access to the actual uh, i can't see the browser right? it's headless so that's that's limits your choice and it's very specific targeted to very specific things then uh the reason i would use is it once you get the hang of it it, it, it took took us two weeks to really understand how it goes and uh, what's the api and to explore and and figure out how to write test and once that i think we we wrote uh, the test for that application entire application in in Three, three again. Total three weeks. I mean, we had in three weeks we had the complete test suit, uh, which was running for that application. And that considering, and we again we did not choose to automate all and all the workflows. We were we were automating only eighty percent of the common workflows that a business uh, that that were possible in that application. So uh, again, what you need to automate and what you want to automate, that's again a drive uh, for choosing the framework. I would say. Does that kind of answer your question? Or am I digressing a lot? Um, no, it sort of does. Okay. And probably we could also say that uh, since Casper gives you the confidence with WebKit and uh, yes. Gecko, you can at least use it to eliminate details. Yes. Yeah. And focus your manual human effort on, on I. On I. I. Yeah. You I would do that. do that. Yeah, I would do that. Yeah. And, uh, from from what I said, I I did a little bit of preparation before coming here. So uh -huh. apparently there's a there's a automation tool for IE as well called Trident JS. My internet is not working. Okay. There's a like Phantom is for WebKit. So apparently there is a JS thing for uh, IE as well called Trident. Okay. Uh, that was an experimental project, but uh, I don't know how much the development is happening on that. Mm -hmm. But apparently. There was a time when people were using it to hmm. automate IE tests. Okay. So people could uh, look it up. So yeah. Still right. So that's that's one of the. Trident or JS. Trident or JS. Uh, but uh, from the experience, I can tell that even uh, uh, you, I mean that when you have different browsers, right? When you are displaying something, right? Even if you take uh, the same object or even different browsers, mm -hmm. there will be a, even a pixel gap. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I mean, okay. So uh, we have project called Pico. This is a project. So their uh, difficulty is about the PPT rendering. Okay. Right. So on different browsers, when you have seen the same PPT, you would expect to see in the same way, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, even they couldn't find out a very good way. So yeah, they they did a hard part like. Taking a snapshot and comparing the pixel by pixel, I mean, I did a, a very much image processing 
programming rather than you know writing any test cases for a specific to browser algorithm. So if you want to verify a look and feel, I think uh, there is no you know hard and fast rule that this will solve the problem. Yeah, I think so, exactly hitting the same point. Uh, I have something to add. So, so, so the real aim, I think, we what we have used acceptance tests for in general, is to uh, is to not do exploratory testing. I mean, automated testing does not and cannot right now, at least, get rid of manual testing. I mean, if you say I have automated tests that test everything in my application, and you wanted to shape them. I would still do some exploratory testing before. I would still do UAT. I would still uh, figure out uh, some scenarios manually myself, just to get and find out the bugs related to you know your uh, IE or Firefox or browser compatibility. There are so many variables and so many things going on. And since we are still not standardized on HTML, even HTML, and also on the browser engines, and we are still so that's probably the reason we we can't really have we can't really get rid of. You know, manual testing. If you even if you have 100% automated test, and that's the stage right now. Uh, probably in future, if we have, if we get to a more standardized web, that's probably when uh, we would we would be able to have that more confidence there. That if my automated test run and if I have 100% of them covered, I can just just ship ship the product. So that's that's probably for the future. But for now, we we have to do some uh, some manual testing, exploratory testing. So. So, uh, looking from uh, uh, single page web applications and uh, from the HTML5 mobile apps, so do you think, I mean, like, from your experience, uh, do you think Casper.js can fit in there? I mean, like, when a, uh, you know, a complex uh, single page web application, so when there are a lot of uh, components which are uh, rendered from there and here, so uh, do you think there also Casper uh, is in there? Uh, from the next yes. So the question is, sh should I use Casper for uh, for single page apps yes, and very high UI rich component apps? Uh, uh, what I would do uh, is I would I would try it out for one one case because what I've seen in UI apps or, or in very high concentrated or rich UI apps is uh, you have mostly all the bis the the logic, right? Business also on UI and also the presentation centric logic. If you use Angular, right? This app uses Angular, so there is a lot of uh, things like if you, if you look at it, right? If I just add something, uh, there is a lot of classes that are changed and it's very dynamically, uh, so it just modifies the HTML dynamically. And the, the problem could be uh, if you have enough, if you have a way to nicely select, uh, select the, the DOM elements. And assert there that that would be okay, but uh, but if so, I, I mean this is probably not a good example, but uh, if you do something, if you do some action here, that uh, that reflects on lot of other components, right? You you have kind of an event, and that you have so many listeners for that event. So if I check something here, it it is updating this item, it is updating this item, it is adding this item. So it is man, it is doing three things at once. Uh, so, so to verify this and to really uh, locate these elements and find out, we'll see. It becomes complex a bit. So, what I would do to start with is I would try to write a one test and see see the feedback from the test. Get the feedback from the test. Is that test readable? That's probably the first feedback I would see. Is that does that really make sense? If I is that maintainable in a sense? If I just change some HTML element or if I just change something, does is my test breaking up? Even even though application functionality should not be breaking, that's that's one feedback that I that that I learn from the test, and then I'll choose whether to do go with go with any framework or not. I mean, to start with any framework, what we do is we always do a spike. We always try to try it out once. We don't we don't make a decision. Okay, let's go ahead with this. We we just I think this Angular is good, so let's go just go ahead with Angular. That's that's not the way uh, we we should do in general application development. You should be able to try it out and. And learn from your mistakes and learn from your past experience also. Saying, okay, I've used Angular for that kind of application, but this is probably a different ball game altogether. Would this framework or would this choice technology suit this purpose? So it's coming back to using the right tool for the right job, right? For the job at hand. So it's again is learning from mistakes, learning from uh, and trying out some things and learning from that. So uh, again, there is no 
silver direct answer to that. There's no black and white answer. Would I would I definitely use it? Would I not use it? It, it all depends, kind of. On but how. Bottom line is like Casper is not good for more of like very dynamic pages where the DOM elements are really created. Uh, again, I don't want to give that impression because I have not tried that. So I, again, if you are getting that impression, then. But as long as somehow you have to look at that DOM element, right? It should yeah. be in the page. But what happens normally in complex uh, cloud web apps which I have seen mm -hmm. is we conditionally render some kind of blocks. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then only it's HTML they created when the browser's compiled. Right. But so that is happens. that is true for any yeah. uh, any framework which is out there which tests the DOM, right? Correct. That's Selenium. Uh, it's, there are two things, right? Sometimes you just hide the issue and sometimes you don't create the issue at all. Right? So, so if, if it is hidden, you can still test with cast? Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, if yeah. it is not there at all, it's just the logic is itself, the backend is controlling front end somehow for creating some documentation. So, in that case, probably. Yes. Yeah, so there is a way to uh, check that also. There is a way to check a certain element exists, assert the xpath selector exists. No. So that check kind of yeah, checks so your... Can be yeah, so that rendering. there are checks for that. Or, or maybe, you know, can we wait for element... Yes, rendering. there is a way to do that also. You you, you re requested some resource and you are you wanted to wait for that resource to be available and then you wanted to do something with that. Uh, so I've seen good examples when people, uh, what they have done is they have... Casper, you just wait until something is loaded. Yeah, so maybe let's, I think it's a good point to go through the high level APIs what these what, what are available in Casper. So you, you have uh, a lot of them related to, let's say, let's look at... So this is one, this is the one that we looked at, uh, capture the screenshot. This is, you can click any button or link or anything with the selector again. Everything takes a selector if uh, if it doesn't make sense, right? So everything takes a selector there. Then you can uh, you can get the entire page source code and do, if you wanted to parse that or do something with that, you can download resources. Uh, there is way to uh, evaluate scripts <coughs> on the fly. So that's that's one, uh, which we can, we'll, we'll be touching that uh, if we get there. Uh, so you can evaluate some function on the DOM. Uh, to do something uh, when when the page loads, I can ask it to run some function there on the DOM. It's like going to Chrome console and then running the function there. It's 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 just like that. You can evaluate it directly on the fly on the DOM. Uh, then you can check for elements that I, that exist or not. You can uh, you can even do uh, forward and backward with the URLs. You can auto refresh the page. You can do all those small. Things. So these are really not the capabilities of Casper, but they are of Phantom. I mean Phantom is so Casper is why we use Casper. I mean, you can use Phantom also. Uh, th the reason we wanted to explore Casper was Phantom. We started, we found out that it's it's kind of low level API, and then you have to deal with HTML page, and then you have, it's a very low level API. And you this Casper provides a very high level, and exactly that that's what they do. That they say that it's a high level API kind of on top of Phantom uh, Phantom JS. So uh, so that's. That's the benefit that you get. That you worry about the business flow and not worry about low-level HTML and low-level code. Right? You work with high-level languages. Uh, you can get attributes of the elements. You can get uh, HTML. You can get title. You, I mean, it's there's so many APIs. You can wait for selectors, wait for resource. Uh, you can work with pop-ups, with frames, iframes. So there is good support for that, uh, and that all comes from Phantom. So if you if you know something is possible in Phantom, probably that's possible in Casper because it doesn't do any magic on top of that. And I think uh, we haven't had a case to to really go to Phantom to do some things. Uh, the existing Casper APIs that we had uh, that that are there, they were sufficient for our needs. But I think I'm sure it, if there is a way to if there is a need to go to Phantom, there is definitely a way to go to Phantom and then actually do ask Phantom instance, inner instance to do some things for you if there is no API for that in Casper. I'm sure there must be a way to do that. Although we haven't had chance, we haven't had the requirement to do that because the Casper API itself is, is nice and good. It suits 80% of our needs. So so that's that. You had something to say? Okay. Okay, so uh, I think let's take a time check. We are 11.45. So we'll spend another half an hour if it's fine. Are you? Is that fine? Are you guys uh, following along and is it nice and clear for you? Because we haven't really covered anything. We just, we, I wanted to cover so much, but it's, it's just basic, basic stuff that we have covered.
Okay. Uh, you know about dealing with those elements like select drop downs or radio buttons. Uh, uh, is that is that okay if I if I demo that we we've, we've had that uh, application that we wrote tests for. They had that those elements, some of the elements, radio boxes, text boxes, text areas, and this, and uh, we can cover that during that. Or for now, I can just give you a way to. So there is a fill uh, fill fill URL for fill API. You can fill a form. So if you have a form, that's how you would fill a form in Casper. There is a simple way to just if each of these is given a name, uh, you would just say this and that. And if there was no name, what you would do is you could also select this by uh, fill, fill, uh, by selectors. So you could say, okay, I can search by input with name is equal to that, and then fill the value. So there could be any other selector over here. I could select by ID. I could select by whatever. Because typically the newer forms that we typically do, there, there's no. I mean, if it's all client side, we don't need to have the names or IDs. So there could be different selectors that we can use over here. Uh, we can we can take it afterwards. I think it's fine. If it's fine with you. Uh, so. So what could be the so this is one test right? What we have done is we have tested that the to do's header is found, but that's that's just very static or simple test. We want to now be able to say if I can add to do or not. I should be able to add a to do and see the to do is added, right? I should be able to do that. So let's let's do. Uh, that, does that mean that uh, only one instance of uh, you know browser is possible? I mean, simultaneously, if we have to run one, to just. Because I'm just using the Casper global variable. Right, right. So, so, so what I could do is, uh, you could. Uh, so yeah, it's just one instance here right now. What I could do is, I could spin up a new Casper instance. So if I had two tests, I could run Cas uh, Casper, whatever Casper JS test, test one, uh, and then. Similarly, I could do Casper JS test too, and I could run them in parallel. It's just one command, right? Like you can run commands in parallel. So th there's a way to do that. Uh, I mean, when, I'm, when I'm typically running a test suite, yeah, you would you would want to parallelize that if you wanted to. Uh, again, we had around uh, again from experience, we had around uh, I think eight or nine tests or ten tests, if I'm not wrong, ten or eleven tests. Uh, but each test had the last. I mean, the, there were some tests which had lot of assertions, lot of setup, and lot of interactions with the element. We were actually using this for survey, survey creation, and uh, testing the survey creation application. So we we had an application where we could create a survey uh, with multiple questions, and then uh, each person, the the individual, would take a survey, and then we wanted to verify the survey report that is generated is nice and clear. So that was a test. So we we had a lot of setup to do. We were to create a survey with multiple questions uh, for five users or three users. The three users were taking that set. We're taking the uh, survey in the test as part of setup. And once that entire data is set up, we were actually verifying the report generation works properly or not. So that uh, that we we had such tests. And I think uh, the average bench. I mean, I don't have the benchmarks right now on the slides, but the average duration for that was in seconds. It it ran in uh, less than a minute for us, so so that was not a problem. But because it's bit headless, right? That's that's the thing. If your application is uh, slow, then that's a different story. But the test would would work properly. And again, if there is if you at all hit a problem, you can always parallelize using basic parallelizing that we just discussed. And if that's not sufficient, then probably uh, you would have to figure out uh, what to, different ways to do that. So now again, coming back to the application, what we are trying to test is I can add a to do now. I should be able to add Casper JS or whatever to do, and I should be able to see that to do there. That's kind of giving me a proper, nice, valid test. Just checking the sample text. That's that's just uh, for kiddos, I think. So let's try that. Uh, uh, so that is my text editor. Okay. So, uh, so what we could do, we could write a different new test for this, or we could uh, let's say do it in the same test. It's again up to us. Uh, so let's 
So let's say we do do that in the same test. In a sense, we uh, or we do it over here before we capture the screenshot. So let's say let's say we do this. Now, once you verified that the header is there, now we want to add the to dos and then verify the to do can be added. So maybe I'll rename the test now. The to dos uh, something like that. Uh, and then I'm going to say once that header check is done, I want to do Casper dot then uh, some function. And this is where I want to actually uh, add a to do. So I want to be able to somehow go to this web page and click on this or select this text box. I should be able to type in something and say enter because that's the only way to add add that. If there is a way to, if there was a button to add, I would have clicked add or I would have hit enter. Both would have worked fine. But here there is just one way to to add, which is to go in the text box and hit enter. So let's see whether we can we can do that, right? So there is a way. Uh, so let's say. Uh, <coughs> so first we want to select the uh, <coughs> select the text box and add the you know type in the keys, type in the type in some text. So again the API, uh, if you Google or if you go to Casper uh, website, there is an API for that. Uh, that's called send keys. You can send keys in in some selector, and then that would be there. So uh, so I can say what we want to find out is I want to first find out what this what this element is, so that where I can where can I add the input. So this is like looks like an input uh, input input text box, which there is an ID there. So that's that's good. So I can use a CSS3 whatever ID selector simply. And uh, so let me copy this to do ID, new to do, and uh, let me say uh, where is my yeah. So so I can say uh, this dot send keys, and the again the syntax is you you pass in the ID selector. So I say that's my selector, and what are the keys that I want to pass in? I, let's say I say Casper keys. So this is where I am. I'm actually adding the text in that text box, as if I'm typing the text in the text box. And now I want to submit that. So there is the only way to submit that is to hit enter. So is there a way to hit enter? So uh, again, after googling, I found out there is an API or there is Casper as this. Uh, uh, so you can we are again hitting some key right so again this has to be send keys and uh, there is there is a way to uh, model enter and that is uh, via again casper's inbuilt uh, event so i'm saying again hash to do i want to insert there and uh, there is so these are a couple of objects that casper gives us and then you can look for methods or uh, internal structures there if you wanted to so there is casper dot page <coughs> There's dot event dot uh, key dot enter. So there is that's the enter key that you can press there using that. So there is enter key. Probably there is escape key also. I haven't needed that, but there's a enter and escape keys there. So if I do that, then this kind of simulates the action of uh, typing in something and then hitting enter. So that essentially adds it to the to do, right? So let's say uh, if we if we can uh, if this works, let's let's just see. And then again, uh, let's for starters, right? Let's do, let's just do this and take a screenshot. We are not really verifying anything. We just want to take a feedback as to does it really work? Because I'm still in exploration mode. I don't know whether uh, how to write and what to do. Uh, I, I'm still in exploration mode. So I'm going to run this test <coughs> and then open the file. You would see that the Casper JS is added. There. So and the to do is added. One item is left, and the the web app has taken care of the functionality. So now we've got we've seen that it works. There is a way to add a to do. Now I want to verify that. Verify that, and that's a verification part. So how do I verify that? Uh, so, <coughs> so, so the way is if you look at this page now. Uh, let's say if we try this. Let's try this out. Let's say test, and uh, so it kind of adds a new 
list element or list here it it is adding a list here right uh, and and if there is nothing there is no list so list is empty initially to start with and when i add something in the to do a list is created or i don't know whether it's created or it's already there with but is it empty i i need to figure that out but the, what i can see is the list is added and list contains one item there the li, li contains an item so uh, what we can do so so what i want so what we want to do is i want to be able to select whatever this list in some way and and check that the size of the list is one for starters let's do that let's say we, we do that for starters like if, if there's a if there's one more element there would be there would be a list with size 2 there would be two li elements right in the list so let's say I, I want to do that first for starters uh, so so I'm, as usual i'm going to say casper dot then <coughs> And once that is done, I'm going to say, okay, you have to execute this block, this function, and what do we execute there is <clears throat> so some way I, I should be able to find out that list and uh, and then verify that the contents or the size of the list is one. So uh, there are multiple multiple ways. I wanted to demonstrate one way wherein wherein we can create a reusable function. So if you look at this this application in more detail, right? You have this list over here. If you go to active, you would see the same list over here. And if if I so let's say let me do a couple of more items here. Uh, and let me uh, so so these are the items that I have and I have one item that is done. Right? So two two so I have total four items, but I have two items that I, have, that I still have to do. The other two are done and completed. So, so there is one list over here. If you go to active menu or active func that functionality, you see another list with the active items and the other list with completed items. So, what I'm thinking is probably uh, since I want to later test the active and completed and that functionality also, is there a way I can get the list? in general like is there a way to get the list so that that is reusable that code is reusable so what i want is something like that we just talked about some, sometime back which is evaluate i want to evaluate some function uh, some xpath selector or something that will give me give me the list that i'm looking for so uh, <coughs> so let me write the function that i want to that i want to be evaluated which is i want to be able to get the to do's get whatever to do's i have these are the to do's or these are the to do's or these are the to do's whatever to do's I have I want to get those to do's so there's, let's let's write that function that I want to get a to do <coughs> so how, how would that look like so uh, so let's say I'm writing a function uh, get to do's and I want to return uh, all the elements that match a particular selector, right? So, what's the way to select this to-do list? So, there is the application. So, let's say let's say we right-click on here and inspect the element and find out what what is there really in the. So, uh, so I'll have to do it this way. Just to, just bear with me for some time. Uh, let's say I'm inspecting this element just so that it fits in the screen size. So there is this li, there is another li. So these are the list elements here, and there is this to-do list. Right? There is this to-do list. So, and when I have when I have one to-do in that, I would have one list item in there. I, if I have two to-dos, there would be two list items. So the so this is the list where it actually dynamically Angular or whoever in the application dynamically appends the items list items there in that list. So that's what I'm looking for really here. Uh, but what I'm looking for is not the to-do list, the UL elements, but the li elements in that, right? I'm, I'm if I if I just say hash to-do list, it's going to give me the UL. Uh, what I'm interested in not the UL, but the actual list items in that, right? So uh, so the way I could do that is I would say uh, 
let's say if there is a, if this selector works for that so let's say we say hash to do list it selected that list for me and if i say li it selected all the li's for me so that's that's what i want i want all the list items and i want to make sure that there is just one when i add just one to do and there are two when i add two to do's and there are n when i add n to do's right so so this is what this is what i want to have this is what uh, going is going to give me the to do list so going going back i'm going to say document uh, dot so this is where i'm accessing so what i'm going to do this get to do function i'm going to run or evaluate this function i'm going to ask casper to evaluate this function for me in the dom when casper loads the page and it comes to this this part it's going to say okay in the document right now that you have evaluate this function for me and get whatever that function returns to me so we're dynamically evaluating the the function the code there and this is just to demonstrate again this is just one function we could have uh, we are again doing basic selection over here we could have actually done some function that does some more manipulations or does some more more logic than than just queries using a query selector right so this this is just to demonstrate one way to do this there are uh, we could also we could have also done it using xpath previously or even css selectors if you wanted to so that's just one of the way that i want to show you so that uh, this is more powerful or uh, useful if you wanted to do some more things in, instead of just selecting some things if you wanted to do some more once you select i wanted to just the third element or just the fifth element or whatever you had some logic to return uh, evaluate probably is, is one way you can use so we're going to say document dot uh, query selector, <coughs> and I'm going to say all. Uh, I want all the elements that match this pattern. So these are all my to dos really, right? These are all my to dos. The each each individual to dos. These are the list items. And uh, I'm going to say now, okay. Uh, so that's just one. So that's the reusable function. But how how do I use it here in the Casper dot? Then how do I evaluate that function? So I can say Casper dot evaluate uh, for me, and then I'm going to say evaluate this get to do's, <coughs> and that's going to return me uh, all to do's. Right? These are all the to do's that that I that I get from that function. All the list items. And now I can say, okay, Casper dot. <coughs> uh, test dot assert. Uh, that. So what I want to assert is the size is one for now, just for starting with, right? Once I have one to do, the size should be one. I can go and verify each of the the text of the to do also that. Indeed, when I add Casper JS, the to do is actually Casper JS and not something else. I could verify that also. But for starters, let's say we just verify we have a very uh, you know lenient lenient assertion here just to check the size of the uh, list here. So I'm going to say all to dos dot length has to be one. It has to be one. <coughs> and uh, if that's the case, then uh, when so so this is the assertion message that you you want to see in the test uh, if you, if you look at the if you look at the test uh, okay, let me enable the debug mode and all that so so that you can i can show you that uh, so this is one message that will be displayed when the test passes or when the test fails you would know exactly which assertion failed so so this is just a meaningful message that you can give so that if, in case a test breaks you see it, see it breaking. You see what what failed. You can really find out exactly what failed. So I'm saying when I add one to do, only one to do is added. Something like that. That's 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 what I'm testing here. <coughs> uh, so so let's say that we'll run that, and again as usual we'll capture the screenshot just for our confidence and just to see if the things are nice working nicely. So, <clears throat> so these are these are the messages that I was talking about. Uh, so, when something passes, you see that that message is displayed over here, and then you can see okay, which assertion failed or which assertion completed successfully. And as usual, we can open image.png and see that the to do is added, uh, which was indeed the case because that was previous for that. So now we have verified that. 
we were visually verify that but now we have a solution that verifies that really right so so far so good so what else could we do let's say we can add one more to do and make sure that the list size is 2 or uh, or what i want to if you if you look at this application what it does uh, let's say clear all of that uh, just refresh this application if you look at uh, these you have no message before right you have no, nothing there uh, when i add let's say something uh, it not only adds the item there, but it also gives you some kind of statistics as to okay, you have one item added, one item left, and if I have one more item, if notice that, uh, if you, if I add one more item, it automatically does this two items left. So it there is a way to pluralize. There is a way it nicely handles the plural, pluralization there. Uh, it's I think thanks to Angular, it's, it's doing that. But you will see that the you I want to also verify that this count is correct. Let's say that this count is indeed one when i add one item there should be only one one item there and one count should be shown properly if i wanted to verify that uh, how how can we verify that so uh, again as usual we will have to locate this element and find out where this element is and and add that so let's say we locate that element and find out where where that is so, uh, so let's say i go and find this element Okay, so where is that element? Ah, there it is. So there is a span for to do count, and uh, there is this true. There is this two here, and there is there is this. Can you can you guys see? That? There is this two over here. Yeah. So I want to verify that the number is one or the number is two also. So uh, again, it's again same CSS three selectors and uh, CSS selectors. So let's let's just quickly do it. Uh, what I would do is I would say <coughs> again uh, I want I want to get the text text this text. To text right uh, so uh, so what there are a couple of apis i mean there's a couple of ways of getting the the actual html content of a particular element so when i say h1 uh, it gives me the content of content of that right we, we just checked we checked for to do's sometime back we just said h1 and then we got the content the text with the text so there is one more way we can we can do that uh, i'm just going to just for the sake of showing different apis i'm just displaying that otherwise there are other simple ways to do this also. So, uh, so what I want is, you there is a way to get HTML, uh, HTML content on from the from the DOM because it's, it's a DOM and then you can you can get the entire HTML content there. So what you can do is you can say this dot uh, get HTML <coughs> and uh, you you would be able to pass in the selector again, which which uh, what's the selector that you want. You can say uh, what we have is we have this to do count, and so what we want is this. But I don't I don't want to use strong because strong there is I don't want to use this ng binding class again because it's not generic enough, and uh, so I need a good way to locate this two element over here, right? So maybe I could say uh, to do count and strong. So I could use a CSS3 selector which says uh, uh, which says something like. I'm going to say hash to do count. So it selects the complete thing for me, and I'm going to say uh, let's say just that element, just that in that. So it just select that two over here, and then it gives gives me the content of that. Yeah. So so that's what I'm going to do over here. That's this XPath that I will use. Again. Uh, again, if I were developing this application, or probably. Uh, Again, that's again. Uh, this is something to learn from the test, or uh, make your HTML structured in a way if you if you call it that way. So this is again this is very flaky lookup. If you look at it, if I, I would call it very flaky lookup. 
if i just change the html tomorrow that's the test is going to break but my functionality doesn't break so this is where there is a uh, this is where you have to do it, do it pragmatically here and uh, and avoid too many of such lookups or too many of such ui uh, coupled look selectors and locations otherwise your test will be so tightly coupled to your ui that even if the functionality changes uh, even if the functionality remains the same if your only ui change if your ui changes your test would break and they would break for no reason because just because that selector if i change it instead of strong i would uh, if i used something else that that test will break right for no reason even though the functionality works properly so so that's one uh, lesson learned from writing good acceptance test is you don't want to be coupled too much to ui if you are coupled too much to ui and the way the html is rendered the way the particular class is used uh, because ui developers if they are working on this they would just change the html tomorrow if they find a better way if they they would just add a new class and uh, and then all your tests would break and they would know they would not know why why that test broke because if they try that app manually the app works the f- functionality works but it's just a test that is very tightly coupled to you and it's a flaky test so uh, avoid such lookups wherever possible in case of legacy or in case of such apps like we don't have control over that so you are, this is where you have to find a control you have to find a sweet spot and you might just say okay i don't want to verify the strict assertions i just i'm okay with lenient assertions i'm okay with just verifying that the to do size list you know this size is one that's fine for me for now so that's where the pragmatic uh, pragmatism comes in and you say i don't want to verify each and every uh, element each and every uh, you know text box or uh, the selectors i just want to verify broadly whether this this works or not just to just to give me confidence and just to avoid a very tight very tight coupling and uh, flaky test so uh, so this is where i'm going to get the get the two here and I, all i have to do is just say casper uh, dot test dot assert uh, it has to be two and this uh, two or i could say equal equals or i could even do assert equals two comma that and uh and oh, no, it was one to do right so it was one to do uh, so you could give the same message to this to this specific <coughs> and this should still work and should still pass and now we can add one more to do now it's very simple now we know how to add a to do it's just sending these keys uh, where is that sending these keys again with with let's say new new input so let's say we add one more to do and see see that two to dos are added let's quickly verify that now it's very simple uh, i can kind of just copy paste this and then say uh, in the new to do i want to now add let's say phantom pairs and again i'm just going to say hit enter there so that that to do gets added so far so good so following along uh, so that test was complete also here which we ran and we have not changed anything it is a strict assertion that we have added so there is no change in the ui here uh, now we've changed we have added one more to do so let's check let's check how that looks like for now uh, so let's just run the test again we haven't very we are not verifying anything right now we're just adding adding one more to do <coughs> so wow. so there is some syntax error which line uh, okay there is one <coughs> it can go back to the error message and you know, then it helping us with the time yes so good that's a good point let me check if i if there is a error message so no it can't tell you it, it doesn't tell me line number but if i deb- if i enable my debug mode probably it should uh, let me check let, let's let's come back to that yeah let's do that so let's here uh, open the emergency yes we have two to do items here right we have the two items it's very simple I mean, that's what we just did pay back uh, so that's it. uh le- talking about debugging and talking about uh, good error message uh, 
so that's important and uh, we initially spent some we had hard time in casper some time back uh, so until we discovered there is a way to nicely debug html also and there is a there is nice logs that it prints so and it's again very simple you just say casper dot options again i am doing this globally over here you could do this uh, not globally you could do this for only one test or something like that but just for display purpose i am doing this globally so i can say casper dot options dot log level and i can say uh, info or debug for example and i can also say uh, casper dot options uh, options dot uh, you know uh, verbos i want verbos logs something like that. and uh, if if i run the test again so it it tells you what how what it is doing so it's starting the phantom js uh, run time and then it kind of fetches the so if i try to uh, can you guys still see this so it is trying to request this http page and got a response of 200 and then it ran the to do headers is visible the because as the first test that we had we were just checking for the header back then and then uh, <coughs> we are uh, what are we doing so step anonymous so i think you can give step names also which will be which will be visible here i think which we haven't done or uh, i need to check that so 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 it tells you which i mean how many steps i think it, it what it does is any time you have casper dot then and casper dot then and chaining of that that counted as one that is counted as one step So, so, so that's what it is. Four of six, five of six, and six of six. That's what it's doing over here. And then capture, save, to blah blah blah. The screenshot. So, so those are the logs. Uh, so that's that. What else can be verified? I mean, we are just uh, adding. We are just verifying the adding functionality. Maybe what we can do is we can uh, we can verify that the to dos can be checked. Uh, Let's say for starters again. Uh, <coughs> so there is a way to check all the to dos, and there is a way to check one to do also. You can just check one to do, and uh, there is a way to check all the to dos also. So, uh, so let's say for simplicity, we'll do this one. I think I tried, I tried with this, but uh, the locators and there is an array, and then you have to do some jugglery to find out this element, only this element, uh, because there are no good selectors for that. Right. So let's just do all 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 uh, elements. So uh, there is a way to. So this is uh, it's an ID called toggle all. So there is an ID for for this this button over here, and when I click that, it it toggles the to do. So it checks all the to dos or unchecks all the to dos depending on the uh, status. So, uh, so let's say we have added two, right? And then we want to toggle. Uh, we wanted to check all the two. So, how would that work? Uh, what we want to verify is when I add two to dos and I check, click here, all the to dos should be checked, right? And probably the assertion would be there is a zero here, so there is no items left. Probably that's that's probably how would I how I would assert that 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 actually the checked worked, and probably also I could assert that. Uh, i think if you look at this uh if you look at the uh js it must be adding some class or something to this to this element over here so that you get a, a strike through font you what you get is a strike through font and uh that's what so it must be adding a class there uh, if you look at yeah can i i mean just To be gone, guys. Can you guys see where is the class added? Completed. Yeah, I think it's a. So how does it? It is called a pickup. Completed. Okay, so this is where it is adding the class. Ng repeat. Okay, so it is adding for all the list items. That makes sense, right? Because we are checking all the two. So we could also verify. Uh, in here that uh, the class i think we can verify maybe but but again that is uh, it's up to us as to how we assert uh, 
and what we want to do is we want to limit or we want to uh, limit the ui coupling as as much as possible so maybe let's just do it with with this the zero items here maybe for now so what i want to do is i want to click here which is a toggle there was a toggle class let me inspect this element again so there is this toggle all and if i click on toggle all it should work right so let me go to console and uh, i can i can verify uh, that uh, dollar uh, or or yeah it's just a simple id lookup so not a problem i can just do it normally here so this is where we'll do it let's say we have added two to do's now we want to check all the to do's so uh, we're going to say casper dot then and this is where we're going to check all the to do's <coughs> so what we what we did here we clicked on this element right whatever the id was uh, we looked up this element and we clicked on that element now there is is there a way to click uh, we want a way to click on a particular element based on selector so so we have that we can just say this dot click and again you will find in the api that this takes a selector which we can pass so we can pass hash uh, okay uh, what was that toggle all i guess toggle all let me verify that that's exactly so let me verify it is indeed toggle all Yes, it is toggle all ID. So I am finding by ID, and I am just clicking on this element that is toggle all. <coughs> so again, uh, as usual, I would not write any assertion first. I would just get a feedback and see if this is indeed happening, and I would run the test. And maybe we can just disable our disable logs for now. And I open the image, and the to dos are checked. So yeah, so that is working. So my selector is working, and the to dos are being checked properly. But now, and to verify that, uh, the, there is zero items left here. So again, I could do do it either in the same lookup selector, and then uh, verify the assert equals is equal to zero. So fair, simple, right? Fairly easy. So let's just let's copy paste that assertion. Where are we verifying this? Yeah. So let's say this one then. And I say uh, and uh, that has to be zero, right? To do count, it's short. Something like that. And if you run that, uh, <coughs> so works. Else. I think. Uh, do you do you want to cover? I mean, we can go on and we can cover more tasks. We can cover okay. Uh, when I click on active, only active to do should be shown. When I click on an active, only an active to do should be shown. And when I clear completed, all the to do should go away, and then the size of the list should be empty, or sh you know, the list should be empty, the uh, to dos list. So we could go and implement and do all of that. Uh, Maybe I, I think what I would like to do is uh, what do you guys think? Should we stop here because it's it, it's not adding much value? I feel it's just plain same thing doing over and over again. So what we can do probably right now is just discuss about uh, anything that you might have. I mean it not it need not be related to. I think we have we have around 15 minutes if my uncle if I'm not wrong for for lunch. So till that time let's let's have a discussion. Uh, about any topic that you might have, uh, not necessarily related to Casper or not necessarily related to testing or anything. It could be anything in 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 general. 
if you have learned something uh, by using some tool share that so let's let's have it as a platform and let's let's uh, discuss about uh, things that that we work on and then uh, our learnings or problems that we face every day right so maybe i have a question regarding this question yeah so uh, we we just uh, had a demo here and uh, we tried to create a case and execute it so we started in some milliseconds and now if uh, i can see your results in near about 5 seconds and so on when we are getting more and more text it has to definitely will take time yeah. and assume that if i want to make it automated automation right so i have a test suite so my first question in short my first question is how to make a uh, created test suite where you know, i can create multiple different test cases and i want to execute in all of them parallelly okay second uh, how can easily you know i can generate a report on top of that i am not more interested in what what are the past you know i am more interested in what get fit fit where it is and definitely maybe i will yeah so yeah cool so that's a good so uh, so what i can tell you from my experience uh, about the reports let's start with the reports first casper uh, we 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 had casper js test running in our jenkins box uh, and we were just printing we were just happy with the so we had the info logs or the verbose logs in, in casper and we were happy with that we did not have any problems there anything something fails we even know what what selection field and what selector face and we even had this screenshot capturing mechanism and we would add that screenshot to the build so that we immediately know okay if i just all i have to do is any test that fails i just have to click on the screenshot to see the page where it failed and probably i know oh, okay i probably missed something there and we just go and fix that test. so that's that's from the experience that that we that suf- that was sufficient for us whereas uh, if you are typically interested in the uh, the the output or the test report generation i think casper has uh, x unit type of so you can you can generate test reports uh, where is that uh, you can generate test reports there is no thing here yeah but you can generate test reports minor using uh, a command line argument saying uh, you can export it into x unit format so that is compatible with your so it's it's very similar to like junit report that you get right this test failed this test passed this test failed and if you click on some test you would see what failed in that test so it gives a nice tabular view of view of that uh, i haven't tried that myself but i've seen that there is a api and there is a way to export uh, the reports in x unit format which is mostly compatible with the ci servers all the ci servers around there so that's that and as far as the is this casper really fast or will it will it will it make my test really slow as as i grow over time uh, so again uh, so probably why it is taking time is uh, is because of couple of reasons right now uh, we are connecting to internet and then fetching that page from the internet that could be one typically on the ci server what you would do you would deploy the application in the la- same local environment so you would not have this network calls uh but you would have the network if the application makes network call for other services you would have that uh so that could slow so that's the application uh, slowing the test down that could be one or is the casper itself that is slow or the phantom that is slow so i mean if i'm right maybe you know you can correct me so uh, in in this during this demo we just wrote it one page and after that we started parsing the same code yes right so when we execute the first test case you know it it get completed in milliseconds probably But uh, currently, I can see that it's taking five seconds or somewhere, you know, uh-huh. uh, parallel to that. So, yeah. uh, and we just, uh, you know, included six or seven steps. Yeah, yeah, true, then. true. Uh, so I can't explain that behavior, <laughs> but what uh, I can I show you is, that. yes, I can. Because what I can show you might also face similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So what I can show you is, so we have this application that is, I have this application that is running, and let me see if I have uh, test per test test. So we had this uh, one spec with with couple of ten of whatever ten fifteen tests, and uh, this was the report generation that that I just mentioned, right? There was a survey creation tool and there was a report generation in that. Let me see if this is still running and how much time it takes. So so this is pretty okay, I think. Let let's just verify the. Number I think is twenty thirty seconds probably. <clears throat> again, this is again off my local host. So it, so I have thirty 
So there are 30, there are not 30 tests, there are 30 assertions that I have, uh, but some of them are very complex assertions which uh, which require us to do a lot of setup data also. So this runs, runs in 22 seconds. So frankly for us, I haven't, we haven't done heavy unit, heavy acceptance testing. We haven't uh, used Casper for, uh, Casper for a big project wherein we have thousands of tests and we automated all of that. We haven't tried that. Uh, but for what we have tried, we did not have any problems and I think what we have written, that is a sizable amount of tests. If I were to run, again I, I, I can't compare and I don't want to compare, if I run the same thing in Selenium with a browser, it's the browser that slows everything down. So, uh, so Casper being headless is very fast compared to Selenium or because it's browser based. So you shouldn't have any performance problems. In case you are worried about that, you could always group your tests, this is what we could do, you could always group your tests, the slow running and the fast running test. So you could always do, uh, if I have a big application which I want to test right, what I could do is I could uh, have sanity tests uh, which are grouped in one file and I could, I would, I would run that file first so that I just want to verify that entire functionality, basic functionality of entire app works. And then I go crazy in every feature and then I automate that feature and then I check that feature in depth that okay when I add a to do I should see a to do and, and all that, that related to to do. If I have something related to the other part of the page I just check have a sanity test that the basic heading is shown, the image is displayed, uh, there is a form that I can see and some basic very basic stuff which is very fast which doesn't need any any uh, interaction UI interaction. So I could do that. You could segregate your test into fast running and slow running test and run the fast running test before you run the slow running test. So in Casper you can give multiple scripts, we just said one script right, spec.js. You could pass in multiple files and it would run those files one by one. Okay, Space separated I think, I mean you just pass in multiple files, just like in the next command line, you just pass in multiple files and it would run that. So uh, shouldn't be a problem and there are always uh, simple ways to uh, get around that problem is by running multiple Casper instances. Because it each spins up its own separate thing, right? So it's not a problem. Yes. I have something to add to this conversation, which is that when we, uh, well, so those are some of the optimizations that you can do, and yeah. what you say hold true very much. In addition to that, what you can do is uh, sort of look at your testing strategy and see what kind of tests need to be at the UI level and what can be bubbled down and uh, could, can be pushed down to yeah. the lower levels and integration and unit tests. And um, to know more about this, if you can uh, Google or in, uh, on YouTube, search on YouTube about uh, inverting the test pyramid. There was a talk about this in another meetup called Tech Jam in Bali about a few weeks ago, where the title of the talk is Inverting the Test Pyramid, where exactly this, these topics are touched upon. Uh, how do you, that is more of a strategy of that rather than whether to use, uh, rather than how to optimize Casper, it is about strategy of how do you, how do you test your whole application and ensure that everything works at the end of the day. So should everything be UI testing, should everything be integration testing or should you do only unit testing is a call that you take. And if you want to know more about exactly how that happens, you can look for that video, inverting the test pyramid on YouTube, it is there. That will give you a little more input from a strategy perspective, in addition to tweaking yeah. as per day. Yes, very tightly said, yeah, true. I have uh, one more question, sir. No, not a problem. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, because we were writing everything in JavaScript and the biggest uh, time consuming thing which I observed is uh, finding the XPath and everything. So, I, I apparently worked uh, you know, uh, on Selenium that we have a filter and we can simply go record it and you know, we can play it. So, so this help us find, quickly help us finding XPath and everything. So, um, definitely, probably in your real projects or even in POC, you observe these things. So, yeah. is there any quick way yeah. or? Any, any shortcuts? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so resurrection is one tool, uh, which, which I think it's a Chrome plugin or something like that, uh, which records the tests and creates a Casper uh, script file. So I, what I could do, I could just run resurrection. I, let me just search. I, I can't. I don't have it installed. Uh, what do you spell? 
something like that of enemy. Yeah, so this is one tool in, in Chrome uh, that you can use for uh, recording. You use record and script. So you, you would, it would record whatever action you do and then when you stop the script, it would produce an output which is Casper uh, compatible script file that you can just reuse later. Uh, one learning that we had uh, from from any I mean you would even notice that yourself if you if you were to do uh, and dabble enough in testing that uh, any of the record tools they are they are not very perfect and they what they selectors they do they are very UI specific typically they say okay slash HTML slash body slash div slash h1 slash something is equal to that but that's very UI specific in that this is very UI centric and it's very bound to fail again and again and you would have time and nightmares in, in debugging why I failed and then uh, regenerate, recreating those test scripts and the code that they generate is very messy and very uh, crappy to be to be honest and it's just a pain to work with. So so that's, but again if you were to look for XPath, I mean, uh, there are probably good tools even in Chrome you can just right click and create, uh, you know, get the XPath. I don't have that plugin installed but there is a way you can get the XPath of a particular thing and then helps you finding XPath and that. Selectors. So that's it. I have to ask you. So uh, when we talk about Casper JS, you know, we all always say that it's a hack that's something that we do. Like UI doesn't execute and you know, it's done everything. Uh, so you know, it, it is pretty faster compared to say another thing, right? Is there any other difference you observe or uh, you would like to highlight here that you know comparing Selenium or any other uh, advantage of using Casper? Okay, so yeah, yeah, good question. So when would I use Selenium and use not use Casper or vice versa? Probably uh, again it comes back to since that's what we I have experience with. So probably that's and it has worked well for us that time. So we had this application that I just showed you, right? The, the 2030 test. Mm -hmm. We had this application in Node JS, and it was all JavaScript style. So it was very easy for us, and it was very quick for us that we find something that's in JavaScript, so that we just just gives us a momentum, and no new tool needs to be installed, and uh, you know Java virtual machine and, and all of that stuff. And uh, and this is very easy to start with. Like you just say npm install Casper JS, and then bam, and you start running the script. Uh, if you know the API, there is no uh, jar to be downloaded, there is no profile to be created for Firefox or anything like that. There is no setup, much of the setup involved. So, for quick running things, uh, that's what we tried for that approach, and that's what we felt, we felt the value was added for us. So, uh, so probably that. And uh, again, we had all JavaScript, so that again kind of had has a, had a decision on going for JavaScript framework uh, for acceptance testing. To add to that, Selenium for headless test, it uses a HTML unit driver, yeah. uh, which doesn't recognize modern libraries. That is a problem with Selenium. So if you use the web driver, it is very good, but the HTML unit driver doesn't work. So if your Jenkins box is headless, then uh, you cannot use the web driver. That is a problem. Hmm. That's one more thing. Yeah, okay. So again, uh, my knowledge there is a bit limited, I think. Uh, as in we haven't really tried it for for a heavy application, which I think, which is what we are going to do now. I mean, we I'm working on a project right now, which, which has heavy, uh, which does a lot of network calls and which fetches data from multiple sources. So, so, and we have currently not written any acceptances for that, for now. Uh, we are fine with basic UI testing and basic uh, sanity testing by basic manual testing. We are fine with that. So we want to now write tests for that. So I'm, I'm thinking should maybe we maybe Casper will fit there, and then uh, I'll have some more learning in terms of uh, using it for a bigger application. Uh, so so to speak. So not not 
I mean, I can't tell you from my experience because I don't have. But what I can tell you uh, in terms of as even the other applications, even the other test frameworks, they have the same mechanism which which this has. So I'm guessing there should not be any big big worry or big problem there. As long as you your choice is uh, made properly, as long as you care only about the functionality and not care about whether it looks fine on this, whether it looks fine on that. Uh, and you can again always separate that, right? You can always write your acceptance test in Casper for functionality, for making it fast and headless, and you can do the sanity testing there. And if you want a big proper, uh, you know, tests for for browser compatibility and for the other issues, you can always go with other go to other tools and do. So it's uh, it's you can always mix and match the the tools and use the tool that it is intended for, kind of. Probably my team gets written to separate both ways for test Yes, so that's yeah, so that's uh, I mean you can always maintain that in the same repository and have set up differently. But yeah, there is some overhead there. The skill shared might be different. Yes. Yes. Handy on the test Yeah. So you can easily go and do it, but possibly or some other tool. Right. 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 Yeah. So that's that's one. So again, that's the, that's where we we usually pair on uh, on everything that we do in Equal Assurance, right? So so that there is no dependency, and we get to learn from other person. So that's that's one of the things that we follow as part of uh, our process. Uh, and we uh, again, maybe I want to point out here that the acceptances that we wrote, right? This this was not written by QAs specifically. We were involved actively, and we wrote it. And we treat this as a normal code base. We treat this treat this as a proper code that we have to maintain and work with. So we try to strive to keep it clean, maintainable, readable, and we try to learn from the the feedback from the code. Right? What it says. If it if the tests are just becoming messy, probably uh, there's something to be learned there. Uh, and and probably as as Vatsala said, I think maybe should we you know, should we automate this? Should we you know drive this from UI? Or should we drive this from simple unit test? Will that suffice? So these are the questions that you have to ask as as a team and take feedback from when you when you code actively uh, in, in in any product. Uh, assume that you know I write a test case. And, uh, let's take this example only, right? So in this test case, we already ended two to lose, right? I have a separate unit test. JavaScript file which takes on from there, right? So my question will be uh, if I have two separate file which uh, you know the first one is creating input or you know, creating a base for the second one, right? So and if I execute in a group, will it maintain my state or will it execute uh, on the new package? Right. So uh, so again that comes back to writing tests. So what I would do is I would write a test that's so every test should set up its own data. So test should not depend on external environment to set up the data. You you can use setup and teardown methods. Casper also has that. There is a way you can do global setup for every every. So let's say there was some some something right, some web page that you wanted to download, some image that you wanted to download before you can proceed with the test. You could do that in setup, for example. There is a way to do that in Casper. Every framework like you know logging the website. So yeah, logging in the website. So you could do that. You could. Do that as part of setup, uh, or every test can do that. So you could extract that out into a into nice functionality, uh, which is what exactly what we had done. Our tests were, if you imagine, they they were they had to create the survey. People had to log in and fill the survey. Admin had to log in later and check the survey. So there was all this setup. So we had extracted that nicely into small small methods and small small reusable uh, snippets that we can use for other tests also. So every test kind of was setting up its own data and was very uh, clean and readable in that way. Possible to share 